I was saying to Joe, uh, clearly he hadn't played baseball because uh, he would have known that the cleanup hitter doesn't go first. The heavy hitter should uh, follow, but uh, there we go. We are what we are. I would like to start by uh, opening Psalm 11. If you've got your Bibles in front of you, I want to read from Psalm 11. It's a bit loud. Because I'm going to speak about the church's prophetic calling in an age without foundations. Psalm 11. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow, they have lined their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. And then I also want to read from Hebrews 12. Just briefly here. Hebrews 12, verse, verses 22 to 24. great passage. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is the word of the Lord. Um, that passage in uh, the Psalm 11, first of all, I want you just to note that the speaker that says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? This is, these are quotation marks. This is somebody who's mocking God and suggesting that they can destroy the foundations. And what can the righteous do if the foundations are destroyed? And of course, the answer, the Lord is in his holy temple. His throne is in heaven. In other words, the foundations cannot be destroyed. However, we do live in an age that is trying to do so. We live in an age without foundations. Uh, one of the analogies that did strike me uh, as a way of illustrating this is uh, a sailboat analogy. And uh, James provides that himself when speaking about taming the tongue, but I'm going to use it a little differently. He talks about... Uh, the tongue being this, like a rudder in a sailboat where uh, a large ship can be driven by strong winds and yet if it has a very small rudder it can uh, go wherever the will of the pilot directs. It seems to me that a church without a rudder is a church without foundations, is a church that first of all can't go with the wind and can't go where the pilot wishes uh, furthermore, it can't tack against the breeze. And finally, when, a, when a, even a small gust comes up, it goes over. And you'll know that if you're sailors at all. If you don't have a rudder, you're not going to stand upright. You heard already from Joe about the departure from the Word of God in our churches, uh, in our culture, uh, the loss of biblical faith and values and how the Council of uh, Chalcedon articulated this definitive understanding of Jesus as God and man. Uh, separating church and state, understand, an understanding of freedom that uh, we have inherited but which is rapidly being lost as uh, the light of the gospel is fading and darkness seems to be abounding around us. And in the context of that, I want to speak to a few other things that he did touch on, but uh, and to some extent uh, anticipated. But I want to say a bit more about that, and that's particularly the explosion of esoteric forms of spirituality. And I see them all around me in Toronto. I'm sure it's the case in other cities, but Toronto probably more than others, just because of its multicultural nature. 
abounds in them. It's an A to Z of uh, esoteric religions. You've got everything from astrology to Baha'i to Buddhism to chakras and channeling and crystals uh, to Wicca and yoga and Zen. A to Z. And everything in between. I had a very long list that I curtailed for this, and you, but everything and anything is being believed in our day. We have palm readers all over the city. Uh, all of these for, are forms of religious naturalism. The collapse of God into nature, the belief that God or divine power is somehow in nature and that we have access to it through the natural world. And a lot of those that I just mentioned have relatively unfamiliar names to those of us who grew up here in Canada, but they are actually forms of, the, of one thing, and it's a very old thing, the perennial philosophy which the Old Testament identifies with the worship of Baal. The sex gods that were prevalent in the land of Canaan before it was given to Israel. This worship of Baal, the Asherah poles, the worship of Ashtoreth, Ashtoreth, the, the queen of heaven, and uh, the gods of fertility. Now, invariably, we see this in the Old Testament, whenever Baal and the sex gods are worshipped, uh, we find pansexualism, we find cultic prostit prostitution, we find the abuse of women and children, the destruction of the family, and of social order, and the worship of chaos is the fundamental principle of the universe. And that issues forth in order to contain the chaos in a form of statism. And that's a way of managing the chaos, but chaos is all actually a principle of the whole order. And so revolution is also uh, in inherent in the ancient world because they have a cyclical view. You know, what you, you, you're on top right now, but there is going to be a downturn, and invariably somebody's going to come over. They don't have our view of history that it starts here and it ends there. It's coming around again. So if you're in power, you're going to be brutal and ruthless in your suppression of those around you because they're going to look to usurp you. And that is the history of wherever the word of God has not been held on to is revolution, destruction, and also oppression from on high. And if we hold to those anything other than the all-sustaining word of the triune God, who is categorically distinct from his creation, we are going to get that outcome. We're seeing it in our day. This idea of the transcendence of God uh, and his categorical distinction uh, from his creation is absolutely crucial to our discussion here uh, this, this afternoon. Uh, I've got a colleague at, Vic, uh, at Tyndale, Victor Shepherd, who says that the, the doctrine of creation ex nihilo is perhaps the most important of Christian doctrines uh, for that reason. The idea that God is outside the created order and therefore not implicated in the sin of the created order, not bound by the created order, therefore he can intervene in the created order and he can govern the created order. He can't be overthrown. He is in his, on his throne in the heavens, as we just heard in the Psalm 11. So that's an important first point. The second aspect of the biblical witness, which I think is important with respect to Baal worship, is not only is God categorically distinct, distinct and above it, it's also the fact that unlike the uh, gods of this world, the God of the Bible speaks. The dumb idols of the Canaanites and all of the gods around them are mute, they are dumb, they cannot speak, but the God of the Bible speaks. And when he speaks, he reveals himself. Now this is, this is crucial to the question that was asked, uh, what's, the, what's the direct application and how do we address this as pastors? And I did sense, uh, and if I sensed it wrongly, uh, forgive me. But I do sense out there, there is something of a failure to trust that God will do as he says, when, which is when his word is preached, he will honor that preaching and there will be consequences to it. There are always consequences and they are good ones because God is good. He reveals himself to us in his word. And this, this entails very important things here. First of all, the fact that God speaks, and he only speaks to uh, Adam and Eve, by the way. He doesn't speak to the other creatures. 
That means that we are able to respond to him. This is a logical implication of it. When somebody speaks to you, they assume that you can answer them. If we're able to answer to God, it also entails that we are uh, morally obligated to answer to them. So there's a moral aspect to even being spoken to by God. You're morally accountable to him because he's your creator. And because he's good, it also means that when he speaks to us, that blessing comes from his word. Now, to a sinner, it may not appear as blessing. It may appear as curse. But, but, and that's because it collides with our sin. Our sin here is God's blessed word, and we are convicted of our sin. But the sin is not, the, 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 the purpose of the word is not to curse us, it's to bless us. The way it blesses us is by revealing our sin. And the good news is that we have a savior who is the solution to the sin. So trust the word of God. God is transcendent and God speaks. Hold on to those two truths here. Because when God speaks, he doesn't just give us information about himself, he reveals himself to us. So if we want to develop a personal relationship with Jesus, which is an evangelical distinctive, we need to obey every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's how you cultivate a personal relationship with God. You obey his word, because by obeying his word, you obey him. By obeying him, you get to know him better. And I'm, that's just the pretext for what I'm going to say as follows. Now, these are significant uh, observations in light of what I said a little earlier and Joe mentioned at the outset, these esoteric forms of spirituality which are now exploding all around us. And it concerns me because I'm a father as well. I am a professor of English at Tyndale University and the uh, pastor for college and career students at Westminster to young people, in other words. And nowhere is there a greater threat to these young believers than uh, the radical egalitarian teaching of tolerance and all-inclusive oneness, which they're taught throughout their lives. Now, this was decried back in the 80s when I was an undergraduate. There was a book called The Decline... Um, uh, what was it called? I've just lost it. Nope, I'm confusing a variety of things. It was Alan Bloom. Closing of the, Closing of the American Mind. He talked about the only virtue in American universities being tolerance. The only virtue. That means that we will include everything. We can already see the seeds of the present in the 80s there. If you include everything, then you have accepted both falsehood and truth. Education is over at that point. Justice is over at that point, by the way. The justice system is immediately undermined there and everything that follows. And I'm going to go into detail about what follows there. I remember when it came really clear to me when I came back to Canada after spending 12 years abroad uh, and I was speaking, I think it was even in my first year of university, uh, at Tyndale rather, uh, to a young woman on the gay marriage issue. And I was outspoken about this at Tyndale at the time. We uh, uh, distributed a petition uh, to, uh, for professors to sign. Uh, some of them did, not all of them did. The institution did not. Um, because uh, it wasn't uh, perceived to be politically astute to do so. Uh, we would use back channels and other means of doing so. Um, this girl who listened to me, she was very, she was very bright. Um, she agreed that this was the orthodox position for Christians to hold my view, which is the traditional view of marriage. I agree with you on that. But she said, sh we shouldn't be imposing our view on other people. We, we don't want to hurt other people's feelings by claiming our way is right and their way is wrong. That's what she said to me. And I, that was the first time that it had been said to me from an evangelical, in an evangelical context, and I thought immediately, and I said to her, but that would mean that we wouldn't be upholding the truth. We would be saying that there, you know, there's this way and that way, and it doesn't matter which way it is. At that point, all is lost, I thought. It didn't even occur to her. Now, increasingly, I have found since that time that young evangelicals agree with her, not with me. And they identify their, their Christian life with the pursuit of personal spiritual growth, only known to themselves, and God. It's a personal relationship. It's a private relationship. And only that, or as we heard earlier in the uh, works of social justice. So it's a wholly visible 
and material and earthly understanding of what justice is, never mind that we haven't defined what justice is, that's another part of the problem. But progressive Christians, which are increasingly dominating evangelicalism, uh, in, at least in my orbit in, and in the emergent church, they openly declare that doctrine divides, but the spirit unites. Openly declare this. Of course, when they do this and they emphasize social justice, they put, make Christianity no different than any other religion because almost every religion will emphasize a, a spiritual vividness with some sort of social action. And indeed they don't. And you will find in the emergent church, almost invariably, they move very close to whatever religion you want and they will mix and match them. The Bible calls this syncretism. They don't seem to see the difference. Uh, as a consequence, they also think that charitable actions are the same whoever does them. Well, you don't have to be a Christian to do good things, do you? I get that question asked to me all the time. doesn't matter what they believe. In fact, by their reckoning, those who appeal to the church, as uh, 1 Timothy 3.15 does, as the pillar and bulwark of truth... Uh, you know, those like me that say that Jesus is the only way to God, these, are, these people are, are an impediment to good works. If not the love of God, we're excluding people. And we're preventing people from doing good works by saying this. So there's a hostility there. And despite the inclusive, you know, the sugary hug of we're all one, let's uh, sit down together and grab a few crystals and chant, um, there's an immediate hostility to the one thing which is not tolerable, which is to say that Jesus is God. And if he's God, there are no others. That, is not, that cannot be tolerated. Now, this has been amply documented by countless evangelicals now. But it's very common amongst the younger, de younger demographic, and if you're pastors, you'll have them in your midst. They're, they're teenagers and younger. As I say, if you're sending them to public schools, they're not going to think any differently. They couldn't think any differently because uh, the public education is no longer about education. It's about indoctrination. And I'm not just talking about test results dropping. Although they don't drop, they keep getting better every year. They do. My niece has a report card in which the median grade in her class was 80. That's an A. How can the median grade be an A? Um, so there's that measure of things, but it's also that you, when you query them on what they're saying, they've, they've separated knowledge from anything of value and application. But that's perhaps a, a tangent I don't want to get onto here. Education is a bit too uh, low-hanging fruit for me. But, and this has been demonstrated in a recent book called Elastic Morality. It, it, I don't know if you've uh, heard of this or read it. It, it uh, describes the morality of the younger generation, which, as they say, is very elastic. Now, I find that the, the recommendations that the book prescribes are uh, not to my taste. That's a gentle way of putting it. Uh, it's basically, this is the way they are, and if we want to minister to them, we need to sit alongside them and not speak against that, because they won't receive it, is what is being said. Now, this, to me, is a sign of rebellion against God by those who ought to know better. Because the biblical principle uh, is that of uh, repentance and conversion, not inclusion. If they don't know the truth, how could they ever respond to the truth? Well, if we don't believe that it's true, how can they know that it's true? I've found as a pastor, as a teacher, that they're looking to me to uphold the truth. And if I don't do it, no one will. And all around them, they're seeing adults that are willing to, in order to be alongside of them, and I'm not quite sure why uh, that is the case, but in order to get with the young people, they talk like the young people, they accept that, and they're not going to challenge them on that. Now, you can't just do this in one session, but is there a consistent application of that throughout their lives? I'm not seeing it. So, as I say, the, the, the gospel principle is of repentance and conversion, not inclusion, and yet, as we've heard, I think, twice now, even conservative evangelicals implicitly endorse this uh, by their own truncated gospel. Now, the, the great uh, phrase here is that, uh, is that of 
justification, the great doctrine of justification, which I hold to uh, dearly. Justification is the article by which the church stands or falls. It's attributed to Luther and others that uh, follow him, uh, repeat it over and over. It is the article by which the church stands or falls. The word article there uh, has a number of meanings. One of them is uh, index finger. It's the articulus. It's articulate. You point to things. Sorry, I'm an English prof. It's also a hinge on which a door swings. Well, there's so much emphasis in conservative evangelical circles on the hinge that they forgot the door. Justification is the article, the hinge on which the door swings. But if you talk about the hinge and forget about the door, what's the purpose of the hinge? Speaking only of the cross and personal salvation without talking about the kingdom of God is like talking about the hinge without speaking of the door or where it leads. Hinge without a door presents a gospel without a kingdom, it seems to me. In Ephesians 2, verses 19 to 21, the the Apostle Paul teaches that we Christians are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Now this is a statement of Christian identity. Who are we? We have to know who we are before we're going to speak to the problems that we've identified here. Well, who are we according to Paul here? We're root, we are those who are rooted in the truth of God's word. We're built on that foundation. What is the foundation? It's the apostles and the prophets. Well, what is that again? It's the whole Bible. The apostolic witness and the prophetic witness. Christ himself being the cornerstone that holds them together. In other words, the whole Bible. When we depart from the truth, we lose our identity. My dear friend and former pastor, Bob File, uh, who's now up in Scotland, used to say that, Joe said this already, although he wasn't listening, and hopefully you'll do better. It takes a whole Bible to preach a whole Christ to make whole Christians. He was listening, actually, just couldn't remember the catchy phrase, but it takes a whole Bible uh, to preach a whole Christ to make whole Christians. Uh, That was said to me repeatedly. It's a nice little line. It also represents uh, the whole counsel of God. And I do think that God's every word is necessary for our development as Christians. And we, in my nine years when I was under his ministry, we had the Old Testament taught as much as the New Testament. And I don't think that's the case in our churches today. And I've just noted the similarity between uh, Baalism the worship of the Canaanite fertility gods and the intellectual climate of our day. But how many of us actually preach from the Old Testament? How many actually read it? If you don't read it and you don't preach from it, how are you going to know what God's holiness is? Joe talked about Leviticus. That's where the holiness code is rolled out. That's where the Jew begins his reading, by the way. Not in Genesis, but in Leviticus, because that's where we know what our God is like. And it's laid out very specifically what his holiness is and how it affects every area. And minutia, we don't like the minutia because we want to associate holiness with something way up there, but not in the little details down here. But God reveals his holiness in the details. And the details matter. And that says something, not speaking here about the specifics, but the fact that God is interested in the specifics and that holiness can be a part of those, that does mean that there is a relevance to every area of life, which we've already heard articulated. Leviticus 19.2 says that uh, we are to be holy even as the Lord God is holy. That's a commandment. And in Hebrews 12 verse 4, uh, it's made equally clear, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Without holiness. I said, when we depart from the truth, we lose our identity. Well, what do we call someone who loses his identity? What's the word for that? Amnesiac, right? Somebody who has lost his identity is an amnesiac. He doesn't know who he is. He's forgotten who he is. Have you ever thought about how terrible that would be? To forget who you are? Forget who the people around you are? And what it would be like for them? 
uh, I've, I'm told by a friend who has uh, done research into mental health issues and this sort of thing that one of the consequences, if the worst one in fact, and it's one that didn't even occur to me because I thought forgetting who other people were would be the worst consequence. I would forget who this pr woman beside me was. Oh, that's my wife and that's my daughter. That would be terrible. He said the worst aspect is that the person who has amnesia is he forgets who he is. Now, why is this so terrible? It's terrible because this man has no recollection of his own past experiences and therefore nothing to guide him about how he's going to act in the future. And nobody around him can rely on that man to act in accordance with his developed character. The wife will say, that's not the man I married. You're right, it's not. He has no history, he has no memory. I talked about the church being like a, a sailboat without a rudder, a church that has lost its identity in Christ, the truth, is like an amnesiac in their midst. Is there any wonder that nobody wants to talk to a Christian if the church doesn't even stand for what it says it stands for? I say to you this, uh, say this to you not to rebuke you, but to, although that would be okay as well. <laughs> I don't have a particular problem with that, but to encourage you to trust that identifying ourselves with God's plenary word is the way to reestablish our identity and to reestablish credibility and reestablish a witness amongst our peers and this nation to bring about the prophetic witness of the word. I'm going to amplify that. But as somebody who has no recollection of his own history, his own character, it can be a moral monster, and probably would be, quite frankly. He's never, he can't remember his discipline, he can't remember right from wrong, his left from his right. This person is never to be trusted. A church that has no identity is not to be trusted. Martin Luther uh, says that the ultimate proof of the sinner is that he doesn't know his own sin. Our job is to make him see it. He doesn't know his own sin. We have to make him see it. How do we make him see it? We reveal it to him. What is the definition of sin in Scripture? Lawlessness. How do we then reveal people to people that they're sinners? Teach the law. Where do we find the law? The Old Testament. When Jesus speaks of the scriptures and all the scriptures referring to him, what does he speak of? He's referring to the Old Testament. In fact, on the Emmaus Road, he talks about the apostle or the prophets and everyone before him pointing to him. He's referring to the Old Testament. And yet, most evangelicals avoid the Old Testament. They talk about, even if they don't use the language of dispensations, some still do, we can talk about that, Many have abandoned that, and yet, functionally, they still are dispensationalists because they don't go to the Old Testament and the law of God, and it's abiding relevance to their current situation. They don't trust the, own, the words of Jesus on this. And if we want to, uh, another illustration on this, look at James 2, verse 19. We're told that the demons believe in God's existence and tremble. That means they're totally orthodox. They could teach in our seminaries. Right? They, they, their, doctrine, their doctrine is all perfectly clear. They can affirm this is what God's like, but note that there's no moral accountability there. In fact, there's a moral rebellion against it. If we don't understand ourselves to be morally accountable to God and don't preach that to our congregations and don't speak of the holiness necessary to see God, then how will we differentiate our congregants from demons? How will they know any different? Where is their identity? Remember, Jesus is the Messiah King. Who's he the Messiah of? He's the Messiah of Israel. Our own Lord's words are instructive. He says that everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. On the other hand, the one who seeks an alternative is like a foolish man who built his house on a house of sand. 
Uh, the past three centuries have tried to replace the foundation, which is the word of God, with different ones. The Enlightenment tried reason. The Romantic period tried uh, primitivism as a foundation or emotivism. The 20th century tried existentialism. Uh, the universities reflected all three of these. All three are now dead and buried. For, so the past three centuries of trying to construct knowledge and university life on anything other than the word of God are now in ruins. Nobody appeals to enlightenment rationality anymore without being laughed at. Nobody appeals to, well, whatever feels good to you must be right and true without being laughed at. Nobody's going to appeal to an existential understanding as a understanding of reality. These have all been thrown under the bus. They're gone. And we live in the consequence of that. It's again like the parable explains, when the rain came, the streams arose, the winds blew, and each of these false foundations collapsed with a great crash, Matthew 7.27. It's called postmodernism. Uh, I hear people speak about what a wonderful situation it is. The false foundations are gone. This is great. What an opportunity. And yet what they are not recognizing, and I see it not in the seminary at all, is a, an awareness that instead of the openness that we might see as the possibility there, that what we see in our culture is the rejection of all foundations. Okay, well, if that found, the false foundations don't work, let's try no foundations. For the first time in a very long time, let's try and live life with no foundations whatsoever. That's the, that's the nature of postmodernism. It's not that we have an open opportunity. We do have that, but, but there's an active and more hostile agenda to the church is that we will accept no foundations whatsoever. And we're going to live life in accordance with that. We've already refuted, uh, alluded to a few of them uh, today. Um, references to God in the sense of one God, transcendent, those are passés. Uh, uh, young hipster Christians refer to their spirituality. They don't even refer to their faith. Um, and they're going to affirm whatever works for you. That, you know, if you like that, that's fine for you, but that's fine for me. And the mantra of self-help books uh, flood evangelical bookshelves. What are self-help books other than you find your own path to spiritual enlightenment? Even when they're written by evangelicals, even in evangelical language, this is pragmatism, this is self-centeredness, and it is rooted in the same view, really. It's the therapeutic culture of around, uh, all around us being brought into evangelicalism. We sing choruses about Jesus as our lover, uh, Jesus as our friend. Do we sing choruses about Jesus as our Lord and our judge and our king? It's not just what we affirm, but it's what we don't say, which says something about where our theological convictions are. Note that we don't sing Jesus as Lord, or when we say it, he's Lord, do, again, does the Lord have a, a land? Does it, is the earth the Lord's? Do we affirm that? Does he have a law, which if he's king, he does? Do we affirm that in our courses? We don't. So that the very things that we sing betray a collapse of our belief in the God of Scripture. Choruses and singing the whole purpose is to give us an emotional boost on a Sunday. Give people a lift. They like that one. And we can see another definition. So there's the infection in the church. Let's look at the society at large. The family is redefined as a voluntary association of multiple persons, gender. It's a solely internal choice as to what I am. You can't tell me otherwise. There's no physical uh, resemblance there. Marriage is redefined as an evolving uh, social construct. At present, it's just same sex, which is broken in. But actually, once you've broken the mold, and there is no definition, anything can happen. And there's no way of preventing that. It will come. It's already actively coming. Polygamy is rife in Toronto and the Islamic communities, and it's, the officials look away from it. Uh, human life is being redefined to eliminate suffering and therefore open the door to abortion and euthanasia. Uh, personhood is being redefined to include animal life. You know, so that we, can, we personify animals and we speak of animal rights. 
You can't have rights unless you have responsibilities. If you had responsibilities, then you could speak of an immoral dog. You know, a bad dog, that's a morally reprehensible dog. We don't speak of that. If a dog does, you know, he bites you and you seek to take his food out of his dish and he bites you, you say, you shouldn't have done that. That's what a dog does. But you don't think that's an immoral dog. So it, in other words, it doesn't have rights. We're just, we're just pushing that on it. Well, this, but this, I, again, this is the collapse of the human and the godly realm into the natural realm, and it's the redefinition of these things. Now, does the church speak against these things? Even Does it even recognize these things? All of these are symptoms of life being rebuilt on a place without any foundations. And the church doesn't even see it. And so we come to a period of tumult unprecedented in modern times, and perhaps since Pentecost, when everything that can be shaken is being shaken. That's what's going on. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken. And this is, this is not a pleasant picture that I've presented so far. But remember, uh, the question that was asked in Psalm 11, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do, has already been answered. The Lord sits enthroned in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The academy has no answer to this at present, but the word of God does. The word of God has an answer to the anti-foundationalism which we see all around us. It's not a new idea, by the way, trying to act as if there were no foundations. Uh, the psalmist uh, speaks to a situation which would be common to God's people throughout all ages, but we see it specifically in the Older Testament. So the slaves in Egypt, where is the foundation on which they live their lives? They are at the mercy of their pagan masters, absolute mercy. Until Moses came with the word of God and his mighty acts of deliverance over the so-called gods of Egypt. Until that point. And he brought them out of that land into the land of Canaan, told them not to be like the Canaanites. Don't do what they do. What did they do? They did what they did. They acted just like the Canaanites, even to the point of, uh, in Jeremiah 7, we're told that the Israelites even sacrificed their own children to the Queen of Heaven. Well, who's the Queen of Heaven? This is Asherah, the sex goddess. Why did they do so? Because it was easier for them. It's difficult to live in the midst of pagans, by the way they were told to drive them out of the land and not lived in their midst. They didn't do that. What was the consequence of that? These people became a snare to them. They did compromise, and invariably we do that. And do, does any people do this better than Canadians? Canadians are nice. Canadians are tolerant. It's something that we describe ourselves as. It's a national characteristic. I find it... Uh, note that humility is not one of the national characteristics. There's nothing more self-righteous than people that describe themselves as nice. Um, what, is, what does that mean? The word nice, actually, in its original means ignorant. <laughs> not knowing. The word science means knowledge, and the negation of that is no, the, nice, the nice. So you're ignorant. Let's act as if we are ignorant. Let's act as if we didn't see any distinctions here, and we're not going to say anything about it. So this, uh, what we call tolerance and niceness, is actually a climate of, a clim climate of acceptance, inclusion, toleration, which suggests that there are no things that are worth saying this is true and this is false. It's a recipe for disaster. Canadians need to stop being so nice. Never mind Canadians, the church needs to stop being so nice. I'm not saying they should be nasty, I'm saying they should be truthful. And the, the reality is that by being truthful, you are doing a better thing than the person who doesn't speak the truth in that context. It's never loving to affirm somebody in his sin, never. Good, the good news for Israel is that God's covenant uh, was one that God committed himself to, and he stayed with his people in exile. And he spoke to them through the prophets and spoke uh, and called them back to the law, the Torah, to the law of Moses, 
And at the same time, he talked about a king that would come and would fulfill it. And as I said, everything up to this point sounds doom and gloom, but we don't live in the time of Moses. We don't live in the time of the prophets of the exile. We live in the time of the king. When God doesn't just represent himself to us with words, but with power. With power. Now, we, we heard about suffering and the, and the way the church has worked through suffering, but it works through power, not through the suffering. The suffering even includes, the power even includes the suffering. That's how powerful God is. Even death can illustrate his power. But it's not the suffering itself which is powerful. It's the fact that suffering and death are under his dominion. They're just examples of it, but they're not the, the, the main thing. To suffer for the sake of suffering is stupid. It's nice. <laughs> if you want to do it, go ahead. I think it's, uh, it's a way of denying God's lordship. He didn't die in order to die. He died in order to bear our sins and rise up. Christ's prophetic office means, in effect, that Christ represents God to us, not just with his words, but with his power. Jesus is the light of the world, the whole world, and he comes to show us what the Father is like. If you look at John's Gospel, there's this re repetition that, whatever I say to you, I have received from my Father. And I've said nothing to you that the Father hasn't forgiven me, uh, leave to say, etc., etc. And... Uh, in Deuteronomy 18.15, there is this reference to him there that Moses foretold of this great prophet, the Lord your God will raise up for you among your brothers and you must listen to him. That's from Deuteronomy 18.5. Turn with me to Acts 3 uh, for a moment and I want to look at how the Apostle Peter just picks this up. Acts 3, uh, reading from verse 22. Men of Israel, no, nope, that's not it, that's two, sorry. 22. Yeah. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you, and it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all that the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the, of the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. What that means is that Jesus is the prophet that is promised, and his words come. Is he like the other prophets? In one sense he is, in another sense he's most certainly not. No other prophet is raised to the right hand of the majesty on high and sits down. When he sits, he rules. To sit is to be in a position of authority in scripture, right? The Hebrew rabbi sits when he teaches. The king sits. When he sits, he sits and rules with equity through his law over all creation. Jesus seated at the right hand of the majesty on high means that God now rules. How does he rule? Through his decrees. Do we listen to his decrees? Do we obey his law? What is his law? Is the law of the Old Testament different from the law of the New Testament? Are there two gods? Does one contradict the other? I'm asking you this because I've, I've heard suggestions that there's the law of God in the Old Testament and then there's the law of Christ in the New Testament. He came to fulfill. Right. And what does fulfill mean? Does it mean cancel? No, he directly repudiates that. He means to put it into force. And now it has power. Before it didn't have power. Now it's going to do God's kingdom work wherever it is proclaimed and wherever it's taught. There is the good news that belief in the Messiah will bring you into this kingdom and he will give you it. He will clothe you in power to go out into the world to preach the gospel to all nations. But you are to bring the law to all people. And the history of Western civilization is precisely that. By the way, jurists in this country, 
bear the marks of the Torah on their necklaces or their, their necks here, these two tablets, the two little white things, those are the two tablets of the law. It's a part of English common law. It's a part of our whole legal system. Joe was alluding to this earlier. I think most people just fail to recognize that. The church has certainly stopped preaching it. We live under the reign of King Jesus, and the good news is that is a reign that cannot be overthrown. So I've talked in doom and gloom, but the doom and gloom is simply that we are preaching doom and gloom. There is no doom and gloom. Christ is king. Has the king fallen from his throne? No, he reigns on high. He just wants people to declare his victory, that he's Lord. We have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So what's the prophetic ministry of the church? What's the prophetic ministry of the church and all that? Because his prophetic work doesn't cease when he ends his earthly ministry at the ascension. It doesn't cease then. Louis Burkhoff notes that Christ continues his prophetical activity through the operation of the Holy Spirit. His teachings are both verbal and factual. He teaches not just through his verbal communications. He also teaches by the facts of revelation, his incarnation, his atoning death, the resurrection, the ascension, but also the giving of the Holy Spirit and taking it into all nations, being translated into different languages. God's law is now being brought wherever his kingdom is. Is there any place on earth where God's kingdom is not? No. It just needs to be declared there. This has another implication. Since Christ is the word incarnate and the central figure in biblical revelation, it means that we cannot divorce the work of his spirit from the written word. We can't divorce them. True prophecy has to conform to what scripture teaches about Christ and his kingdom. The word and the spirit are both God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Can the spirit act differently than the rest of God? No, the one conforms the other. The the Holy Spirit floodlights God. He leads us into all truth. We need to remember that when we're thinking of prophecy even. Most of the prophets in the Old Testament are false prophets. How will you know a false prophet? Well, false prophets' words don't come true. Jesus' words all came true. He fulfilled them. In other words, do everything that Jesus commanded us to do. What did he say? Listen to Moses. Is that now not true under the law of Christ? Is the law of Christ somehow contradicting the words of Christ? And he's poured out that same spirit now on all flesh that your sons and daughters shall prophesy. That has been given not just to ministers of the gospel, it's been given to us in the legal profession, in the economic profession, if we're teachers, if we're parents. It's the Holy Spirit has been given to us and we are to act as if King Jesus reigns and tell your children, teach them, Deuteronomy, the Shema. That's the commandment. Teach your children that God is one. Uh, the church's mandate to educate is a part of that. It's been the church's history from the very beginning was to educate their own children. They didn't send them to the pagan schools, the academies and so forth. They educated their own children. That was a part of bringing the gospel because it wasn't being heard elsewhere. When I say that it's been given to all people, that doesn't mean that there isn't a special place for those who are uh, raised up as teachers Uh, elders who labor in teaching and preaching, as 1 Timothy 5.17 says, but it does mean that every believer can speak prophetically and judge prophecy, can hear it, discern it, uh, as is appropriate. If you've been given the Holy Spirit, then you have the capacity to discern it. Now, you're only going to discern it if you're given it. So the regular uh, refusal to give people what the Holy Spirit declares as true is going to mean that a people don't recognize what's true and false, right? But once they do, the people know it and they can smell it. Even if they can't articulate it, it's our job to teach them to articulate. We give them language to do it if we're teachers. But they will know it and they will smell it and they'll go everywhere and they'll say that's right and that's wrong. And even if they can't say why it is, they'll say I'm not going to have that. The reason Canada has flipped overnight is because 
under the guise of a Christian culture, what was underneath was that that was not being taught. People lost their sense of smell. They became like amnesiacs. The church started acting like an amnesiac, and then the whole culture did. Why did the church act like an amnesiac? Because it stopped teaching the law of God. It didn't forget the gospel. I've heard the gospel when I've been in the midst of evangelicals. You know, Christ is Lord. Repent, convert, trust in him alone. It just doesn't mean anything to them. They can't live their lives by it because they, live, they do live in the world. And they have to. And they, that's part of their witness to do so. But how are they distinct from the world? Well, nowadays they're not. I want to conclude with one uh, wonderful illustration of how uh, this has this prophetic calling, which has been received by the church, has gone out in power and has manifested the kingdom of God in a miraculous way. And it's that issue uh, of slavery. Uh, the Bible says that if we are uh, sinners, that we are slaves. Right? A sinner is enslaved to sin. Uh, the It's the teaching on slavery that Christians have brought that has relieved people, the lordship of Christ and the freedom that comes from that that was spoken into the institution of slavery which has been there ever since Adam and Eve first sinned. Slavery has been there from the very beginning. It remains there. It was there in Africa when the traders came to Africa. The slave trade was going on long before the Europeans arrived there. All the same, the Europeans when they did arrive, and it was banished by the way from uh, Europe. It was banished from Europe because of the understanding that scripture speaks against it. But when the Europeans came to Africa, they seemed to forget this. And this is an ugly uh, scar on the church's face and there can be no excuse for it. All the same, there were those that called the church to account for that. And the social historian Rodney Stark uh, observed, first of all, that it was Christians who concluded that slavery was wrong. And that it was also Christians that called uh, people back to the conviction that that awareness had been lost and it needed to be recovered. And so men like William Wilberforce in England, uh, John Woolman in the US, they were not motivated by some UN uh, notion of universal human rights. That would be anachronistic anyway, but they had no notion of human rights. They appealed to what scripture said about the institution of slavery. Deuteronomy 24-7, uh, 1 Timothy 1, uh, verses 9 to 11, both forbid kidnapping, slavery. There is uh, in scripture uh, an endorsement of uh, indentured servanthood for a period, maybe three to seven years, and after that you'll be freed. But man-stealing, taking somebody and, and a racially, you know, taking a whole nation, this is forbidden in scripture. They insisted on this. Now, this didn't, even though they spoke out against that, you know the history yourselves now. Your pastors, you've heard this, the story is wonderful. It's still worth hearing again. The change didn't come overnight, and it didn't come through Wilberforce and Woolman alone. They, there were a vast army of believers that pressed on this, and they spoke to people about it, and they adjured or, or asked Parliament to speak to them about it, and gradually the tide swung from being, uh, I mean, Wilberforce was laughed out of Parliament at first. He was one man standing up. Think of the abortion uh, climate of our own day. And think of how different it is. There are some parliamentarians who will stand on that. Wilberforce was one who spoke up. After decades, he was poised to win. And they knew it. And there was a desperate move by the, uh, by the uh, planters, and they played the trump card. They said, if you do this, the economic cost to us will be so enormous that commodities will go through the roof and economic ruin will result. So for pragmatic, practical reasons, even if you think this is right, don't do it. They appealed to pragmatism. What did the abolitionists do? They were so convinced by the clarity of scripture and what the law taught on this point that they agreed to compensate the slave owners of all freed slaves, and that was a sum that amounted to half the British government's annual budget. Mm -hmm. The costs were so high that one historian has called the 1833 Act of Emancipation voluntary econocide. And the historians to this day don't 
have an explanation for it. They note it, but they have no explanation for it because it doesn't fit with their understanding that everyone acts in accordance with his own self-interest, your class interest, whatever. Here, there's no interest. In fact, on the contrary, it was only loss for them. They paid it at themselves.